Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Gastonia. We are so grateful that you have chosen to be with us this morning, and as always, we pray God's blessings on each of you and each of us gathered here as we worship together. Just because we are worshiping remotely these days does not mean that ministry does not continue. And so again this week, I encourage you to go to our church website, which is fpcgastonia.org, so that you will uh, be able to see what all of the missions and ministries are that we continue to engage in and see what it is there that you might be able to participate in. Because everything that we do is for our community and for the world, and we do it to God's glory and in the name of Jesus. So please come along and be our partners in ministry. Friends, as we begin our worship service this morning, it is such a joy to be gathered in this place together, and it is such a joy to be able to proclaim that once again, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Let us now worship God together. Good morning. Appreciate you watching online and gathering together, even if in spirit. So invite us all into a posture of worship, whether you're here in the building. Let's go ahead and stand together. Uh, if you're at home, whether you're standing, you're sitting on your couch, you're reclining in your recliner, just make it a posture of worship and mentally bring yourself and focus towards worshiping God and let us sing his praises. our sins away, oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. above you, Lord. One hope, one life will shine forevermore. Your kingdom in heaven and on earth. Your children stand to sing of your great worth.
joy and expectation. And we gather in beauty and wonder, we gather to confess our sins to Almighty God. And when we think of our confession, we remember back in 1989, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Canada occurred. Over 10 million gallons of oil washed upon the shore of that great land. And volunteers rushed in to take the little birds and the other animals and gently, gently clean the grimy mess off of those many birds and other wildlife. And it is in such manner that God does that. God takes when we've sinned and when we confess our sins, it's that God gently takes us and wipes that grime away and restores us. God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So together, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, making that prayer of confession our own, followed by our own time of silent personal confession. Let us pray. Eternal God, like spoiled children, we complain about the sufferings of this present time <clears throat> without considering the blessings of living under your care. We tried to hide from your searching gaze. We've climbed mountains. We've gone deep within caverns. We've flown to the farthest edges of our souls. And wherever we go, you are always waiting for us, welcoming us. Even in the darkest recesses of our hearts, your light always shines on us. Lost, we are found. Afraid to speak of our sinfulness, you hear our stumbling words before we shape them. Unable to help ourselves, you redeem us through the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Revive now the hope that is in us. Grant us the patience to wait for it through the power of your Spirit and in Jesus' precious name. the people said, Amen. Brothers and sisters, please listen and believe the words of the psalmist in Psalm 40. God lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. Know that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Lord and gracious God, thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet. We ask now that you silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing your word we may seek to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please listen now for a word from our Lord as it is recorded in Psalm 139. The psalmist writes, O Lord, you have searched me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hand me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the forest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for the darkness is as light to you. In verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have two interesting scriptures this morning. The first from the Psalms is a familiar one with words of comfort and reassurance. Not a bad message during these uh, unsettling and frustrating days. And then the second passage is from Romans, and it's a little pricklier. Uh, in fact, I'm using a different version of the New Testament again this week in order to hopefully make the words a little easier to understand. Uh, actually, I cannot recall when or if ever I have preached on this particular passage, on these words from Paul, uh, but I chose them from the lectionary specifically today because they seemed so very challenging. And if we're not in the business of regularly challenging our faith, then really, I don't even know why we're here. I am up for the challenge this morning. I hope you are as well. So let's just see where the Spirit blows us together this morning. In the words of Jesus, whoever has ears, let them hear the word of God this morning as it comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. And this morning I'll be reading from the message paraphrase of scripture. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons us. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, What's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who God is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we're going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be, and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. 
All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We're enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what's enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. According to our Savior Jesus, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will never pass away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have any of you who are with us today ever heard the word WYSIWYG? WYSIWYG? Okay. Anybody, anybody out there, have you heard of the word WYSIWYG? Do we have any old computer programmers out there? Because if we do, you'll recognize what Merriam-Webster acknowledges is a word first coined in 1982, WYSIWYG. It's the acronym, acronym for the title of our sermon this morning. What you see is what you get. It's also kind of fun to say, WYSIWYG. I think our world, our country... Uh, is in a very tender spot right now, one that elicits an enormous amount of uh, fear and sadness. And I think this saying, what you see is what you get, in many ways only serves to intensify that pain as if our circumstances just aren't going to change anytime soon. It's, it's an admission of how we feel. It makes my heart heavy, and yet it also brings to mind for me a quote from Dr. Willie James Jennings, who's a professor of theological anthropology at Yale. We who follow Christ are working in wounds, working with wounds, and working through wounds. At the same time, I'm also brought to my knees by the words of our psalmist. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. In Romans, Paul speaks of what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance, which we must focus on, what's coming, because right now, our heritage, our inheritance looked like this, looks like this. The illness and death of colleagues, friends, family, people all over the world due to an uh, uh, unrelenting assault of the COVID-19 virus. Lives filled with inequality and injustice for black Americans in particular, over which there's a ton of discord and conflict, broken hearts and broken spirits. The truth is, Christians are historically disruptive. And Paul was most assuredly one of those Christians. Christians are disruptive, or as Representative John Lewis refers to it, may he rest in peace, we Christians make good trouble necessary trouble. We do not all owe this old life, as Paul put it, one red cent. And this new life in Christ, that it's one that beckons us to holy trouble. It is this new life in Christ 
that demands our attention. A new life in Christ is described in several ways. A life where we have things to do, places to go, and people to see. It's an adventurously expectant life. It is a childlike life. In fact, a life as children of an inescapable God who has searched us and known us, who knows our hearts and all our ways, wickedness and everything else, and still sent his son to save us. It is resurrection life that is full of uh, purpose and work and responsibility, but ultimately, it is a life of hope. And thanks be to God for hope. At this point in our history, when we yearn for benevolent leadership, when our news, our daily news is filled with death and destruction, when even future planning feels completely pointless, hope is what Hope is what keeps despair at bay. Hope, hope is what gets us up in the morning. Hope is the ability to see what we cannot tangibly see. It is an acceptance of an inheritance that we do not fully understand. Hope is trusting in our unimpeachable history with God, knowing that our present difficult times are but birth pangs prior to full deliverance. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. But seriously, not always. So often things can appear to be well when there are actually troubling currents underneath. For instance, when I was 19 years old, my mother was out playing tennis with our next door neighbor. And at the end of the last set, my mom um, confided in our neighbor that after 25 years, she and my dad were getting divorced. My neighbor laughed right out loud. I mean, we were the perfect little family with the four stair-step children, except we weren't. There were those troubling undercurrents, and my parents did get that divorce. I've begun to pay very close attention when someone says they're a cup half full kind of person. It makes me scratch my head and wonder, why doesn't their cup runneth over? We have family, we have members, we have friends who have troubling currents, lost jobs, businesses that are struggling, people suffering with the malignant effects of lifelong discrimination and inequality. Hope really takes a hit. And yet, our new life in Christ calls us to holy trouble, to stand up and to speak up even when it's messy or inconvenient. I believe our new life in Christ calls us to pay attention even when it's exhausting. Not paying attention is a privilege a luxury that not everyone shares. I am convinced our new life in Christ calls us specifically to hard work, hard work that is often unnoticed and usually unappreciated. But those of us who have this gift of new life in Christ are the very ones who are in a unique position, burdensome as it may be, to offer hope. But friends, please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. Just because we have hope and offer hope does not necessarily mean that we escape suffering. 
I'd even, I'd even go so far as to say that in my observation, those who do have hope may be the only ones with the stamina and the wherewithal to endure suffering. When Paul says, waiting does not diminish us, he's referring to the patience that we acquire in our suffering. Patience is not acquiescence, though. It is living a life hopeful in God's promises of love and liberation. Those of us who are inspired to work in the present in this present darkness, we're the ones who work for things to be better in the future. There are those, of course, who would claim that Christian hope is just pie in the sky. And the definition of pie in the sky is actually uh, illusion or false hope. But we know better. We already know in our new life in Christ, this resurrection life, that we have power, the power of life over death. But still we cry out when love is absent, when life is shortened, or when freedom is taken away. We cry out but we always have hope in Jesus Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ is a community of God's children, all human beings who live in anticipation of this new birth, freedom for all, a new day of unconditional love, an inheritance of life abundant. A new day of expectant adventure when we say, what's next, Papa? Because there is nowhere we can go, no matter how far off the righteous path, no matter how much darkness, there is nowhere we can go that is beyond God's unbelievable inheritance for us. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Definition, expectations, you want to ensure that expectations don't get out of hand. A vaccine, if you will, against disappointment. A council of realism against the foolishness of fantasy. Fantasy says, this will go away, the virus the racial inequality, discrimination. But I'm here to challenge and argue against that line of thinking. This is not just what we get. As heirs to a future that is beyond human sight, my new word is wig and whiz. What you get is not what you see. Wig and whiz. Because with God, all things are possible. Wig and whiz. And so this morning, with that in mind, I close with these timely words. Words of wisdom and encouragement from our dearly departed John Lewis. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day or a week or a month or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Because, my friends, in fact, how we treat others is the ultimate test of our love for Jesus Christ. May it be so. Our prayer this morning comes from St. Benedict of Nursia. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Lord and gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. You alone have been our help and guide.
through good times and bad. You alone give us the strength we need to face the challenges around us. You are rest for our bodies and souls. We pray that your presence, we will find the peace and comfort we long for. God, who is full of kindness and love, hear our prayers for this congregation, especially for the pastor nominating committee and for the church around the world that we may be faithful and courageous in the face of all challenges. For mercy, justice, understanding, and peace in relationships between nations that in this time of anxiety about the future, there will still be generosity for all in need. Today we pray especially for those who work in hospitals. We pray for those who cannot find work, that as the economy is reorganized, all who do work will be fairly treated, and those seeking work will not lose hope. We offer our prayer for those who travel, especially those on vacation, taking time to explore your beautiful creation, that as we recover from the pandemic, we will remember to cherish the earth and treat it wisely. We remember those who are teachers and students in schools and universities who plan for a new season of learning in the most challenging of times, that creativity and commitment will lead to discoveries about the world you love and the truth rooted in your wisdom. We offer our prayers for all those in danger and in need, for the sick and the dying, those in fragile places, and their families, and the oppressed, for those standing up against injustice, and for all who still are at risk from COVID-19. We offer prayers for the bereaved, especially the newly bereaved. Grant them your peace. Hear now the words that Jesus taught us, summing up our spoken and unspoken prayers this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord demonstrates to us such great generosity in response to our needs and our request. We are much loved. Let us now share God's love with others in the presentation of our tithes and offerings. If you would prefer to make your gift online rather than sending a check to the church, please log in to the church website, fpcgastonia.org, and click on Online Giving, fpcgastonia.org, and click on Online Giving. Let us pray. Gracious God, we realize that all we have is a gift from you, and now we offer you a part of that. Thankful that your love is overflowing. Bless these gifts and your love so that their goodness will overflow to meet the needs of those who cry out to you and to us. It is in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be 
all again as we close our time together into a posture of worship let us in the building here let us stand together and sing and uh, if you're at home uh, wherever you are watching I invite you into a posture of worship as we uh, close Jesus Messiah name above all names Became sin, who knew no sin, that he might become his righteousness. He humbled himself, carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah. and serve the Lord. Let us go now in this new life, understanding that we have work to do in terms of love and liberty. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, be and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. Loving counsels guide uphold you. With the shepherd's care and fold you. God be with you.